Hello, 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 everyone. Good evening. It's good to be with you. Oh, you turn yours on. Hey, there we go. Awesome. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Hey, there we go. My name is Vince. I'm one of the pastors here. This is my amazing wife, Kira. We are honored to be here. Uh, I have the joy of overseeing our visual media on staff, and my wife um, is an incredible supporter, raises our children at home, and we are a part of this ministry. We are part of the Rock family. We have been here for 10 years, and we're just honored um, to be asked to help host tonight. Um, but I want to ask a question before we get started. How many of you guys just had, like, a long day? And it's just like, look, it, yeah, that's all right. You're among friends. It's okay. I, I want to say a special thank you <laughs> to those who had a rough day. You made the trek out. You came here tonight. Um, I believe God always honors sacrifice. And when we don't feel like worshiping, when we don't feel like being equipped, when we don't feel like training, and we say yes anyway, we take that step of faith, I think there's a special thing that happens in his presence. Amen. So I just want to say thank you for, for coming out. Uh, this is our third Kingdom Conversations. Give it up for uh, equipping and training. Amen. Um, this has been birthed on Pastor Andre's heart, and we just want to welcome people who are watching online right now and later in the future. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we're excited. Um, I want to thank all the campuses for being here, and especially San Marcos, who's in the Yeah! And we have all of the Kingdom Life coaches stand up. We just want to thank you so much for yeah. all that you do. Absolutely. If you're a coach, could you stand real quick? <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, if you haven't been here yet before, the goal of this monthly gathering is to put a heavy emphasis on training and discipleship in the Kingdom Life Ministry to also make sure we're in the same page on unity, best practices. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can operate in the kingdom of God, but we want to make sure we're doing the best we can to stay unified to serve others. Um, this, it's about having a healthy culture of unity here at Rock Church. So that's what tonight is about. Uh, we've got people here, obviously, from Freedom and Healing Ministry. But if you're a part of those ministries and see somebody that you don't know, they might be a PST. They might be on the altar call team. They might be on the intercessory team. And so we're just excited that this is continuing to grow, continue to expand, and be a part of the culture here at Rock Church. Amen? Awesome. Uh, if you've not been here before, uh, we're going to have a conversation with some incredible panelists. Some of them might be people you know, somebody that you might not know. Um, we'll have a, a chance for Q&A after that. So if you're having a question, please write it down. We really are excited to dive into what the Lord is stirring on your hearts. We're also going to have a time for group discussion. So the Kingdom Life coaches are going to help lead those um, groups and then we're going to have an activation led by um, some of our special guests. Um, so I'm really excited, and without further ado, we're going to get right into it, okay? Awesome. So uh, we'll introduce our guests, and then we'll bring them up. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Nathan and Wanda Daniel. They are community leaders. They've been a part of the Rock Church for a long time, and we're really excited to have them share about freedom tonight. So you guys can come on up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, let me want to pray. Um, and I'd like to pray for us tonight, so if you guys could just bow your heads. God, we thank you so, so much for who you are. We love you. You are so incredible, and we would not be here today without you. And so I thank you for the testimonies of what you've done in our lives individually, and I thank you for what is going to be shared tonight. I pray peace over those who are speaking, that your spirit would flow, that they would feel peace and comfort, and that the words would just flow 
through them, that your words would flow through them, Lord. I pray that you open up everyone's hearts and allow us to receive and learn and be open to, to what it is that you want to highlight to us tonight. And so we just bless you, we thank you, and we honor you with everything that we do and we say. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, tonight, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, how many of you guys have been to one of these before? Kingdom Conversation. Great. So you guys know that we're, we're not trying to just bring in experts in a field to talk to you clinically or professionally about what we do. The goal is to bring in people who actually live out what they do. And I can't think of um, better examples for walking people through freedom and healing than these four. And so uh, I'm really excited to dive in um, to what God is going to share tonight. Um, the goal of today's conversation is to talk about living a lifestyle of what Paul calls in 2 Corinthians the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. And that comes from this section in 2 Corinthians 5. We'll put it up on the screen for you guys. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, you and I, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Not to Rock Church, not just to each other, but to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the heartbeat of tonight, not just to, to learn a new skill, to learn how to do something. We want to be people of God that live the lifestyle of the ministry of reconciliation that takes a new set of eyes to see people differently. It takes a, a new mindset when you've been hurt by others to say, am I willing to set what I feel aside to bring people back into relationship to God? That is the ministry of reconciliation. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So we're just going to dive right in to question one. Um, and we're going to start with the Daniels. And so feel free, whoever um, would like to start answering. But if you guys would share a little bit. <laughs> Perfect. If you guys would share a little bit about yourself, how long you've been married, uh, how many kids you guys have. So we have been married 51 years. Awesome. It hasn't always been glorious, <laughs> but it hasn't been totally bad either. It's been really good. Uh, he is my best friend. Whenever that we were dating, I just, I remember. Okay, Go ahead. Okay. So we have a long time for time, so. Um, anyway, so um, when I was, when we were dating, for me, I was thinking, I want my husband to be my best friend. I want him to come home and be excited to be home. I wanted him to tell me things first before he told his buddies. You know, I didn't want him to go out and, and you know, talking to his buddies and then come home and tell me or forget to tell me because he'd already told them. And so in that, I thought, okay, if I'm going to do that, I need to create an environment that he wants to come home to. So when he walks in the door, I can't just start dumping everything out. Well, the kids did this. And I, I needed to create an environment for him to want to be there. And so anyway, so 51 years now, we've been married. We have three children. Um, two of them live in the San Diego area. We have 11 grandchildren, and we do have some great grandchildren that uh, we've never met because they live in a different state, but we do have our new family. Can you share a little bit about how long you've been in ministry as well? How long you've been in ministry? Well, I became a youth pastor at age 17. My father was a Baptist pastor. Her father was a Baptist pastor. Our fathers were friends. We met through our fathers. My grandmother in Texas was her Sunday school teacher when she was in junior high. So it was a long spiritual route. So I got age, saved at age five, served the Lord all my life. We pastor 17, pastor from 20, age 20 on for 35 years, and full time counseling for the last 15 plus years. So 
so much. Or, so one has always been my uh, helpmate that I'm now the initiator. I invite people over for dinner. That would be my idea to be the neighbor, invite them over, that she would make the home a welcoming place for people to come. We have people fly from all the points we live now, fly from all over the world and spend a week with us. And we do marriage counseling with them. She fixed the meals and I would never do the counseling. And then the love that they experienced over that week would then open their hearts to get the deep pain out. And we dealt with a lot of demonization. We've got missionaries from Africa, China, Alaska, Hawaii, you know, all kinds of people from the very rich to the very poor. And the heart's the same. The very rich to the very poor. A PhD psychiatrist, psychologist, because God knew their need and God made a connection. We never advertised, just people told people told people. Awesome. Um, can you share a little bit about what um, your personal journey of freedom has looked like? And both of you can answer if you want to. And just if you can, hold it up a little bit closer so everybody can hear you. I wear a soft voice. Um, but what happened was I came to San Diego to pastor a denominational church. The church grew rapidly, and then there was infighting in the church. And so I got expelled. And so in August of 1983, Santee Lakes, I started a church with no people and no money. Three little kids and big mortgage. That's a hard way to do it. And so four months after I left, I started having this back, chronic back pain. And I hadn't lived in anything, had fallen, doctors couldn't find an answer to it, and then depression set in. So I'm trying to start a church with a big hole in, you know, we shot in the heart. And uh, no money, struggling financially. To, how do we make it? How do we get it going? That's a really, really hard time. God used that in my life to teach me that that pain, that I had never experienced that kind of pain before. For a pastor, your church is somewhere between a wife and a daughter. You love people. You love your church. And so to have that kick in the head, and then financially to lose everything, um, income-wise, was a really hard struggle. And so after two years ago, I feel like there was something changed a couple of years ago. What is it? And then God said to me, God, one day as I spent a lot of time with the Lord in His Word, when the Holy Spirit spoke to me, He said, that feeling in your heart is anger and hatred. Now, I've intellectually forgiven the leaders of the church, but God was even going to teach me to go straight head forgiveness and heart forgiveness. And so one day I said, God, I'll do anything to get out of some kind of prison. I'll do anything to get out. And he said, I want you to sit down with the man that used to be a youth, youth pastor. Now he was the pastor of the church. He had led the, the whole committee thing, the political fight. Sit down at the same restaurant you used to have your staff meetings and ask, you, ask him to forgive you for hating him. And he was bigger than me. <laughs> so we sat down at the same restaurant we just had staff meetings I said would you forgive me for hating you his response was you're an idiot you don't know how to pastor a church hmm. I wanted to bless him with a fist you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I said will you forgive me for hating you he said yes my friends when I walked out the door of the restaurant the depression was gone amen, amen. two days later the back pain was gone amen, amen. God had been saying to me, see, I've been a pastor that time, 15 years, and I've led a lot of people to Christ, but very few of them did I know their story. My denomination, you get saved, you get baptized, teach Sunday school, and tie, you're done. And that's it. <laughs> you know, nothing more to do. You know, I had a seminary degree. We didn't talk about heart ministry, demonization, the Holy Spirit, that's not part of our, you know, thing. So God opened my eyes to see. Now people walk into a little storefront church. I could look in the eyes and see the pain and say, oh, tell me your story. Let's do lunch. I told my story. Now tell me a story. And I just started hearing the most horrible things that were all around me. Childhood zipper slip. Mine, mine was an adult injury. There's just from young childhood abuse. I never that before. I never been taught. No one ever asked me about my pain. I didn't know it. And then I told them, I don't want to spend two hours with one person broken record. Well, not even spend a whole week with one person. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what I needed. I didn't know what I wanted. So I'm saying, that's how God led me. Just one 
Listen, guys, one heart at a time. And now it's in thousands. Thousands. One, and many of those lives, one to touch a thousand lives. When they get deeply changed, deeply healed, they want to tell somebody. And many of them want to help other people. So God can. You know, he led me into something by letting me get wounded and then heal me. It's how he opened my eyes to see a whole world that I've never seen before. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Wanda, was there anything that you want to add, um, either in your own journey or coming alongside of Nathan? So I didn't really have anything like how Nathan did, where God was telling him, you know, he needed to forgive somebody, although I've had to do that. I think for me, and I think even for other people, for you guys as well, when God starts putting his finger on something, you do it. You know, you change, you forgive, you go apologize, you give extra money, you do, you know, whatever it is that God says to do, then you do it. And as you do it, his uh, peace is there with you. You, uh, I mean, you're just getting closer and closer to his heart. And it's, it feels so much better not to have to carry that heavy backpack of all this stuff that we carry. And to have a clear mind, and, you know, and just to be able to enjoy life and enjoy people around you has been really big. And so what we would do, we would have people come to our house and they would come in, I would fix the meals and um, create the environment, get the room set up for them because they would spend the whole week with us. And um, I, I just remember one, one particular guy, he was a businessman and he had come from a different state and he came there, and we were just sitting around eating breakfast and just talking. And a lot of times what would happen is Nathan Nathan would be, you know, in the counseling room, and he'd take the man in the morning, perhaps, and then the woman in the afternoon, and, and then just work with them all week long. And then they would come out and, and have lunch. And so I just, since I wasn't in there, I was just asking, well, how did it go in there today? You know, um, did you learn anything new? Or just asking questions to draw them out a little bit more. And it was interesting because sometimes they would tell me stuff that they wouldn't have told him in the counseling room. And I think part of one of the things is I think God's given me a, a if you want to call it a gift, to be able to ask caring questions. And one of the things that I did is I learned that through playing the un-game. You guys ever heard of that game? It's called the Un Game. It's back in the 70s, a long time ago. Um, it's, this lady made this game, and she couldn't talk for a long time. And as she's listening to people around her, she's realizing they're not talking about anything important. So she started writing down questions. And that it's the thing that you can have at your table that you can sit down with your family. And it's great when you have teenagers because it bring you can. They're having to answer these questions, and it might be questions that you, we've always wanted to know what. What they say, and yet now they're having to do it because we're playing this game. So, so I started learning how, like it would say, if you won Miss America contest, what would be your final speech? What would you say? You know, it's real generic. You could have some just for husbands and wives. You can have some if you have young children. You can have some if it's just a married couple. So you can look online. Amazon, I think they carry. I think you can even buy just the question. <coughs> So anyway, we, I mean, we played that with other people, and I just started learning those questions. And even now, we'll be sitting somewhere, and God will give me a question. And I'll just say, hey, so what was it like when you first saw your wife? What came in your mind? You know, and so I mean, just people look at me kind of like, well, where'd that come from? <laughs> I don't know, but God said, <laughs> I'm just doing what I feel like I heard. So anyway, so this one guy was sitting there eating breakfast with us. And um, we had a prophetic word from another guy that said, God is going to be bringing empty, hollow businessmen to you. Uh, okay, that's fine. So this guy's sitting there, and we're talking, and um, he's, I don't remember what it is, but I remember saying to him, God told us that he's going to be bringing empty, hollow businessmen to us. Of course, you know, we're eating breakfast. And all of a sudden, this guy starts crying, and his knots coming out of his face, out of his mouth, nose. Sorry. And um, I, I mean, I, I was just kind of like, whoa, that was interesting. <laughs> and he said, that's exactly who I am. Mm -hmm. So it was just so interesting. That, but that, that wouldn't have happened in the counseling room. It happened around the table. Many times, we had another guy that came, uh, a young kid who came, 
And he just started telling us some stuff, and, and I just remember patting him on the back going, I am so sorry to hear that. That shouldn't have happened that way. I'm, you know, the way that your mom was, that was wrong. And again, here he's starting to cry. Well, Nathan had gone, to, we were around the table, Nathan had gone um, to the bathroom, and I'm thinking, Nathan, get in here. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, and, I mean, he just broke down and just started crying and crying and crying. And I just put my arm on his back, and I just said, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. About that time, Nathan comes back in, and I'm kind of looking at him like, come on, <laughs> get in on this conversation. And Nathan just went over there, and he just laid his hand on him and started praying for him and, and just um, giving him like a father's blessing over to over him. And, I mean, things around the table, so easy, you know, and to see God show up, it's like, woo let's do this again. It's so <laughs> fun when that happens. That's awesome. So, I'm really glad you shared that because I got to witness you guys working together and it's so beautiful to see the teamwork between the two of you. And I think you could have totally just been like, I'm, I'm not as important because he's the one doing the ministry, but you allowed God to work in you in that moment. It was so, that's so key. Thank you. Um, so Andre and Rachel, we're gonna pass it on to you. We wanna know how long you've been married and how many children you have. Yes, so we have been married 18 years, almost 19 years in November. Um, and then the other question is, how long have you been in ministry? Um, so I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus 18 years ago. And then for me, I started serving in ministry probably I think 16 years ago, serving in like altar call ministry or women's ministry, kids ministry. Um, I'll pass it over to Andre because he has different answers. <laughs> yeah, um, been in, I've been in full-time ministry for going on 16 years next month and been involved uh, in ministry ever since I was a kid. Um, my, my parents were on worship teams, my mom played piano, my dad played bass, kind of just always around the church doing stuff, singing in and being in choirs. Um, but I would say probably all my faith, probably around the whole five, whole five-ish, and jumped into uh, Worship team here when when the church was at Arrow Drive and kind of just been serving ever since. And then, if you guys can share what your personal freedom journey looked like. So I would say I actually, looking back, I received a level of freedom just in surrendering my life to the Lord. So. Um, Growing up, my parents got divorced when I was pretty young, and now looking back, I can see that's where the enemy came in in terms of like heaviness, heavy loss. Um, that left when I surrendered my life to Christ. Um, but life happens, other things happen, and so when we lost our daughter to cancer, that was another opportunity to go through healing, and I, I received a level of freedom. But what I would say is, some years after that happened, we went through like a heavy spiritual warfare season and it almost shipwrecked my faith. Like I was running in the opposite direction of the Lord and I knew I was in trouble, but I wasn't ready to receive help. And so what I told the Lord was, if I'm that important to you, then come yourself. And he did. <laughs> um, it was it was almost a very bizarre season because he started waking me up and he would wake me up with scripture, he'd wake me up with song, and I was like, oh man, what did I ask for, you know? Um, but what happened is when I was finally ready to listen to what the Lord was saying, the very first thing he told me to do was forgive the individuals that were involved in that season of just heavy spiritual attack. And when that happened, um, I felt a lot leave. Um, when I walked, when I finally stepped into like forgiving these individuals, and what the Lord did is he took me through a season. He didn't just address what happened in that particular season of going through just spiritual attack and warfare. He, he used that opportunity to address who I needed to forgive in my life, but then he just kept going. 
<laughs> and so it was like step by step, he was like peeling back these layers of the onion. And so he dealt with the immediate issue, but then he took me back to like childhood, childhood trauma, my parents' divorce, all these things that I had just kind of like, well, that happened. What am I supposed to do about that now? Like, keep it moving, you know? And it was all these things I just had never dealt with. And so that was my, my personal freedom journey. And I would say it's still going, right? Like, we always have opportunity in our life to either step into offense or, you know, step into anger or step into all of these things. So that was, like, the start of my journey. But it is an ongoing process of making sure that I'm staying free. <laughs> For me, my freedom journey kind of uh, was layered, and I see how uh, the Lord works kind of sanctification in our life. I think there's a lot of breakthrough that happened um, at the point of giving my life to the Lord that was a lot of stuff just kind of went away there. And then, you know, stuff with our daughter. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, that was probably the most um, recognizable breakthrough that I had in my freedom journey. The journey, and then, and then there's different things that happened. Like we were under a major spiritual attack about five years ago, and that's how I actually got introduced to Pastor Nathan and Wanda. And they, and so um, they helped us walk through some stuff that we just couldn't see. And so I think, um, you know, we, there's some some work that the Lord does Himself individually, and then there's some there's some equipping that we should have had the whole time, and then there's, and then there's uh, God will use other people to bring about freedom. So it's been kind of continuous and multi-layered. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. We're going to move on to our next question, and um, Nathan, this is going to be more directed towards you, and, and this is about um, deep heart ministry. And so we, we have a definition that we're going to put up on the screen, and it's broken up into three parts. Um, deep heart ministry starts with listening deeply or discerning to hear the pain that comes out of someone's mouth, helping them to learn how to forgive from the heart, and discovering lies that they've believed are truth. And this kind of stems out of uh, Luke 6.45, which says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And so the first question we'd like to ask you, Nathan, is how did the Lord lead you into the idea of deep heart ministry? Well, as, you, as I should have said before, I can see people and see the pain in their eyes. Uh, I think part of my upbringing, my mother uh, was very tender and loving when I was a child, but she began having mental breakdowns. And so I began being sensitive to her pain that made me uh, sensitive to uh, even my wife. When we first got married, we had a great the first month was wonderful. I didn't have any sisters, so when she started being a little bit distant, I was going, what's, what, what's going on? What's my problem? What's my problem? What's my problem? No, I can just tell. I, I do not want a distant marriage. I'm not going to have a distant marriage. So in the kitchen, lovingly put my arms around her and said, We're going to stand here until you tell me the problem. So I said, Oh. I'm really stubborn. Anyway, so I. But. <laughs> <laughs> you know how sometimes there is stuff going on and you don't want to talk about it, you know? And I grew up in a home where it was forgive and forget, so I'm trying to forget and forgive. The cupboard doors are slamming harder. Anyway, so yeah, so he came in and says, We're going to stand here until you tell me what's going on. And I thought, I'm going to win this game. So I said, It's going to take you longer now. Let's cool it down. So I kept my arms around and I walked down the hallway and for two hours. <laughs> she said, let me write it down. I'm going to use your words. Your big girl. Use your words. <laughs> and finally she told me whatever it was. And we can't remember what it was. So it wasn't me. Anyway, we fixed it. The guys, the next time I'll take an hour. And now we've stayed heart to heart hourly for 51 years. Amen. Okay. 
So pursue your wife's heart. It's mm. good. If something is important to her, it needs to become important to you. I keep my hand on her pulse. How's she doing? And I know, I can tell, you know, I've been to a much quick spot on. Uh, because things that would bother a woman don't necessarily bother a man. Uh, she would be more inclined to know what's happening with the kids, and I'm thinking to build the church and to do it. She's just she's being fussy up here. You've been out her night this week. So I would listen to her input on things that, that I didn't sense, honoring that God's given her as my helping to sense things. She senses my leadership. So we, so that in terms of heart ministry, it starts here. If you're single, it doesn't equip you to marry, but I'm saying to you, our first relationship should be with Jesus, and then second with our spouse. And it's worth maintaining. Okay. And I think, too, that if you er do this early on in your marriage, in your relationship, um, it gets easier because yeah, it was hard for me to say anything, you know, to tell, to get my words out. I wanted to write it down, and then I had it. I, I didn't know what I was thinking. I just knew I wasn't, I was hurt. I didn't know how to tell him what it was. It's, Know, specifically that it hurt me and and then when I when he kept saying we're just going to sit here until you tell me what it was and I realized after a little while he's serious <laughs> <laughs> I've got to do something here and so yeah we laid there for a long time until if, if we finally talked about it and I said we don't know what it is to this day but, but that was a turning point for me because I realized he really does want to know what's going on in my heart. Mm. And it wasn't just that one time. It were, there would be other times. For instance, he would have like a board meeting at church. And we might have had a disagreement, you know. And we've never had any big fights, anything like that. We've just, 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 you know, just didn't understand each other what was going on. And he would say to me, I will call the board people and tell them I can't come in. You are more important than that meeting. Wow, I'm pretty, pretty important <laughs> for him to do that. So I would say, guys, you know, pursue your wife's hearts. Don't don't just brush it off and go, oh, it's that time of the month, you know. But but really pursue her heart, and she'll get to the point if she knows that you are going to be in her. See, we want to be in each other's hearts. I want him to be in my heart. He wants to be in my heart. Okay. So if we know that we know that we know that we're going to be in that person's heart. It's easier to talk. It's easier to say it. You know, get down to the, I don't have to give all the flowery, you know, set this stage for it. I can get right down to it and go, this is what's going on. And it takes less time. So I would encourage you to do it. It's very beneficial. See, Ephesians 4, 30, I'm going to read it on the American Standard. It says this to the church. And this is before we get to the marriage path passage. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Now that's the family members by Christ. And the dimension of marriage, even more so, tender-hearted means if I'm tender-hearted toward you, you can say something and bless me and I receive it. But you can also hurt me with your words. And I can be hurt. Now, when I was, I was, in, I was a worship leader before I was a pastor, and I also like to do a lot of hand crafts. And so I, calluses, before the calluses built up in my left hand, I could sense the beads, and I did some bead work, but it also hurt my fingers when I played guitar. After a while, the calluses built up on my fingertips, and I couldn't feel the beads anymore. But I could play guitar because the calluses kept up hurting my fingertips. So being tender-hearted means I can I care about you. I can feel, I can see the pain in your eyes. I can tell your, your personality has changed. Like what's going on? Do you need some prayer? We had to have a tonight at dinner. Anna Marie, you want to start waitress? Pain her eyes. We went outside to talk. Sir Anne had right off her mother just came home with an aneurysm. Out in the parking lot outside, we got to pray over her and bless her. But Anne Marie was sensing, she, she, she was sensing the Holy Spirit. You know, her praying. Right? She's back there, so she was the one of all of our group. You know, the Lord is guiding her, and we ministered to, to the lady. 
So see, being tender-hearted to the Holy Spirit and being tender-hearted people makes the body of Christ flow as it's supposed to flow and minister to one another. I was going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, see, we're talking about marriage and coming to a lunch together and meals and so on. Well, maybe we live alone in your apartment or whatever. There's other ways you can minister to the hearts of people. Um, in 1986, I started my church, and we've been going for two, three years. And so my wife was working part time for the school system, and one of her bosses was a leader in management of the Santee school system. And I was in a city club to meet businessmen, and I met him there. And I said, So I would take your bosses out to do one, and I'd take them to lunch and share Christ with them. So I was 35, he was probably 55, whatever. So on, on January 28, 1986, I noticed a distance of my cell phone of what happened. I had a lunch appointment with this man lined up. So just him and me at a restaurant in Santee. We sit down, he sits down, his face is ashen. Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Don't you know what happened? No. The space shuttle blew up with that school teacher in it, and I had a room full of teenage students watching. It blew up, and now I'm by. And I said, Are you ready to meet your maker? No. You want to be? Yes. I live in Christ. I don't. That fast. Then follow up discipleship. We were having breakfast at a restaurant. We flee. And I'm just beginning to learn about spiritual gifts, and I have a dream. In the dream, he's had a meeting with a woman at breakfast at a restaurant, and it was not his wife. I just knew. Oh, well, I'll, I'll accuse somebody of something. And, uh, after four days, I said, don't talk to him. Maybe it's a morning. So I went to the school district. I said, Fred, I'm assuming his name was Fred. Fred, can I talk to you in the hallway? I said, maybe this is a pizza dream. Maybe it's a warning. My temptation coming away. But I saw you at so-and-so restaurant having breakfast with a woman. It's not your wife. And he went, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm good. I said, well, let's get together and find out. So first of all, you need to repent and stop. And, and he went, new Christian, I just baptized him in Sweden for the week before. So um, we, we had, had a, built a little office in my backyard. We sit down here and I said, Holy Spirit, go back and show us what anything we need to see. He goes, wow, I'm remembering I was six years old and my father put me up on a kitchen countertop and said, fall backwards on the kitchen. And he smacked me in the concrete floor. He said, that'll teach you never trust any man, even though I'm going to even anyone, even your own father. He said, I thought that was a good lesson. I did that all three of my kids. This is an educator, professional. And God had to heal that wound in his heart that only God knew was there. See, we just start off with just lunch. You just never know. It's in God's. So having just building a relationship with someone, a meal is a good way, one of the ways of doing it. It's not the only way, but when you when you accept someone enough to sit and have a meal like says, I she says it all the time. It's it's like he is coming down, I'm gonna want to do that. See? So he look at our look at our master, how many things happen around the table? You know? God oh, asking this question. You know, Marion offers an offering at his feet. Right? So build in relationship and then out of that they say, You you actually care about me? Get time for me? Yeah, can I tell you? And when you tell them your freedom story, you're like laying the answer in front of them. Sometimes you're ready to take it then, and sometimes you've got to think about it for a month. Come back and say, oh, can I tell you my story? And then from there, the Holy Spirit goes in to the deep Um, If you guys can also share with us what discipleship and training look like for you in this area. Well, there's well, you can disciple the brain, and that's good and informational. But discipling the heart is helping someone grow through and find out the places where a lot of us have had something happen in life where a lie got planted deeply. <clears throat> we don't even want to stand because it's in our truth box. Um, and uh, so when you listen to them talk what comes out of their mouth, as you listen, you'll hear them make a statement that's not biblically accurate. That's why you've got to be in your word every day. So you know the truth from the line. 
But it allows something simple like this. Okay, uh, parents divorce when the person is three. When dad leaves the home, the child decides, I'm not worth anybody's love. That's why dad left. It's my fault parents divorced. If I've been perfect, if I had fought my little brother, it's my fault. So I have to be perfect from now on and keep life together. That's a real common one. No one, see, if a three year old decides no one really loves me, then at 18 they get saved, but the three year old heart goes, I don't know, really like, well, maybe I'll take my head off, you know, he doesn't really love me. No, I've already decided a life truth is no one really loves me. That's very, very common. Everyone will abandon me eventually because my mom and dad divorced my dad and I killed some car wrecks. You see, everybody, everyone's going to abandon me. So God will too. My wife probably will too. So I'm not going to get too close to this. I know eventually she'll abandon me. So I'll have an affair on the side because if my wife doesn't make it, somebody else will end up. That's the stuff I do all the time. So until you listen to them and you know what the truth is, and you listen and oh, there's that one statement, you just made that statement. That's the, let's renounce, I mean, Jesus, I renounce the lie that no one loves me. Jesus loves me. This I, I renounce that lie that's protecting my heart. <clears throat> Bullying causes a lot of problems. When a child gets bullied, the demonic presence will jump on the child and say, I protect you. I'll make you smart. I'll make you sexy. I'll make you violent. And so they accept this help that they've got tucked in their back pockets so they can explode when they need to defend themselves. Or I'll seduce me or whatever. I'm going to use my body to get the love that nobody moves in. You so like, nobody loves me for me, they love me for my beauty, my body. See, so that's the kind of thing that unless you love them and listen, and you recognize there's a lie, this is, and they trust you, that you know the Lord, that you walk with you. That's why it really means the ladies mean ladies as ladies, guys with guys, or a couple together with someone, but you don't want a man to minister to a woman by himself alone. That's set up for disaster. Okay. So that's why also having a safe place through the environment, safe, private place to me, when you really are deep, go deep, deep heart things, it needs to be quiet. A huge room like this, we have to walk all down. So, setting the operating table situation is really, really important. First of all, that relationship of trust has to be established where they feel safe and then you feel safe because almost always the enemy wants to get in the sex department. They're so ashamed that he won't tell anybody. And he wants to hurt the next generation and he wants to keep godly sex between the husband and wife from really being here to mess that up. So that's one of the major strategies to get did something that happened sexually. You never told anybody, but you need to, that Sunday morning is just not the place for that. We really don't have any place for those kind of teachings to happen. You know, all you need is one shot, you just got shot, pastors get one shot on Sunday morning to say it all. And that's just that's the beginning place, but we need teams of people that can be trained that when someone needs something more than a band-aid cut, that we can sit down and take Two, two, three hours to really listen, down to the core of it, pull this one out, put the stitches in, and now they can go. That may be the only splinter, it might just be the first one out, where, okay, okay, I feel better now. I'm not working. Second, it's usually a mom or a dad when it gets down here, usually. The last 10 years, I've heard more horrible mom stories than the answers. We have so many wounded, wounded girls that are mommies that hurt their children. One or another. And so that's the deepest wound you'll ever know, or the deepest love you'll ever know, is with your mother. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. We could stay there for a little bit, but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna keep going. Uh, Nathan, how did your two books, uh, Freedom Through Forgiveness and Soul Surgeon, how did those come about? Well, first of all, I don't like writing. I'm not, I'm not a writer. So if any person wanted, I know he said you're supposed to write that book. So it took two years to get freedom to forgiveness written. And I very, very intentionally leaving out the word demon. Because I come from the denomination that believe, that believe in demon, they don't believe in much of the Holy Spirit. And so I wrote it for people from those backgrounds that they would throw them away and say demon wants them. So if you do forgive from the heart, if you start dealing on a heart level, eventually you run into a demon. I would do read the book, read the letter, just read the book, you know, I actually want to do that. And the Brooklyn Dean came out because they dealt with the father of the So that came out in 07. You know, about 015, I was visiting the same friend who's now in heaven, 
he said, he's supposed to write the second book. So I did, out of obedience to the Lord, the second book is going to hire a ghostwriter. They just put all went in 30 years and interviewed a whole bunch of people and he put the book together for me. But it came about just in obedience to the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to be an author, but still an author. I don't have any idea. I'm soul, I don't care. I did my God. And uh, the book is the book. Soul Surgeon is all about how Christians can be demonized and non Christians. And why they're all full of stories and they're all real stories. We, we changed the stories on several levels for many of them. Some people said, I want my name in there and I want my story written clearly. And when they said that, they put their name in there. And but most of them we changed it to high identities. And so I think there's going to be. A third book? And each chapter added is going to be the rest of the story. Because there's some stories that after that came out, there was another chapter in their life that was very encouraging. Um, that we didn't know at the time the book finished what was going to happen in some lives that went on later to bear more fruit in a surprising and good way. So some of the stories are still kind of process. Um, and so as God does, he, he starts taking more and more ground. The more you let him take ground, the more he's going to clean it all the corners. You're just a little room. That's awesome. How many of you guys have read either Freedom Through Forgiveness or Soul Surgeon? Yeah, I've been super blessed by that. And I, let, me, let me read with you. Let me share with you. Awful Chambers, I have a few copies. But and there are going to be books back there, too, if you want to purchase some. The Anna Marie's going to be back there. Let me just give you a little spiritual history for me. Um, uh, when I was in seminary, I had a professor who was the largest seminary in the world, 5,000 students. To Dallas and Texas area. And, um, and had one professor that loved his students so much. He was so humble. He was one of the younger professors. They even asked him, Would you become a professor? He was a pastor. His name was Oscar Thompson. He's in heaven now. He died at age 44 of cancer. So it's a great loss. But he would come in and sometimes read from my utmost for his highest. It's the most widely read devotional among pastors. It's over 100 years old. It's been printed for 100 years. So we brought some copies and we put our little logo on the front. But I want to read, read you something that he said. Um, and this is April, April 24. After he died, his widow spent the rest of her life, she had, she had taken shorthand notes for years of all his teachings. She's one of the fastest stenographers in England. So he died in 1917. So this is in the early 1900s when this came about. Okay. So, um, but I want to read you just a couple sentences that this is really, really why I did what I do, how we do. He said this, one life totally devoted to God is of more value to him than 100 lives which has simply been awakened by his spirit. Mm -hmm. Read that again. One life totally devoted to God is of more value to Jesus than 100 lives which has simply been awakened by his spirit. And I have seen this to be true. I don't advertise, and I'm really getting more and more selective in who I work with because it takes a lot of energy to fight through three days to get to somebody's will to get to the demons, okay? So I'm, you know, I'm just turned 73, I have the energy that it takes to fight through, I've, I've cast out literally thousands of demons. I'm not bragging, this is fact. Um, and so, um, uh, but I've seen that when people get deeply free, then many times they do go on to touch lives for the rest of their life. It's just like, wow, it just like takes off. And because they're funny, it's what they want. It's like a, it's like a race horse with this tail cock in the, in the, you know, in the stall, and you get them loose, and they take off. Some people can't get them to kick them on the stall, you know. <laughs> but I saw, like, see, Oscar Thompson. I don't know if any of the students saw what I saw. I saw the humility. Of, I want to be like you when I grow up. So I bought also, I'm going to have five copies of this in the year, so I'll be wearing out. I went every morning for 50 years. And it challenges me deeply. He says things, I still ponder, what does he mean by that? And he died at age 44. The stuff he wrote in his 30s. But he's still, he's been dead for 100 years. He's still touching lies. And my life has touched thousands of lives because. Oscar Thompson, I saw in him, 
time and man, but I want to be like that. I want to be around you. And yet, and he's the only professor that invited students to his home. He invited us all over to but I just, you just feel the love in his home. It was just a group of students. So, and so that's what I wanted. When I, when I was 16, I began playing the piano at a small Baptist church. My dad was an overseer of churches, so different churches that needed a pastor, he had to find a pastor. So 16 said, son, you can take the truck and drive if you want, but there's a church with the piano player. So I was never really good, but that's all you have, you have a piano and organ, I have a piano. So there was this young couple that he was an airline, he was a pilot being trained for Vietnam, and he went to our church, this young couple. And so one evening they invited me over to their little apartment for dinner. And I went in there, and I couldn't tell you what we ate for dinner, but I felt the love and the peace. And this young couple told me, I want that. And I want a girl that can do that. So I dated 15 girls, but five of them were pastor's daughters, looking for a ministry name. And when I met Wanda, her family, that her mom, the hospitality was there. I felt so secure and so at peace. When I, this girl can make that, you know. I really liked mom and dad both. But I I I married up. <laughs> so to get, so we've always done this. We've always had people into our home. And we had a tiny little one car garage to a semi car garage apartment with pipes frozen during the winter. You had to put the table up you could, you know. But we, there, there was love there. And we brought people even there in a small, deep little place. And we loved our people together. I think for me to, I'm going to kind of tag team on this, but I think for me, I'm not the kind of person that goes and sits in an office or sits in a room and, you know, wants somebody just to spill their guts. That just doesn't seem right to me. But I know he does, and I know you guys probably do that as well. But for me, the thing that God told me a long time ago, we were at a, a conference in uh, Alabama, and they were having a conference, and I told Nathan, I says, I, I feel like I'm supposed to just spend some time with Jesus. I, I don't feel like I'm supposed to go in that conference. And he said, that's fine, that's fine. So I go out there, and it's it's in a very wooded area. And I'm just like, okay, God, where do I go? What am I supposed to do? And he says, come up to this one area. I went up there, and he says, I just want you to dance with me. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I came from a religion that you don't dance. <laughs> that's okay. So I'm kind of twirling around and just thinking, you know, this is my father, and and um, and, I, and he said to me, I love, I love your heart, I love how you play. It makes me so happy to see you play. Mm. And I thought, okay, so I have the spiritual gift of play. So, but and let me tell you how God uses that in my life. There have been times there was a lady, a friend of mine. And I knew a little bit. I didn't know her whole story or anything, but I, she, she her husband passed away suddenly. And um, I said, she loved going to the beach. I said, let's go to the beach. She said, okay. So we bring chairs, and we're sitting out there. I thought, I don't know what to say. So I'm just quiet. And she's, you know, she's just quiet. And we, we were out there for a couple hours and we hardly said anything to each other. We just sat there. She tells me later, she goes, One, you don't know how healing that was for me to just sit out there and not have to talk. But I could hear the waves. I could hear the Father talking to me. I, I could quiet my heart. And it was so healing. I thought, wow, that's fun going to the beach. You know, it's quiet. We didn't, I didn't feel like I had to make conversation or anything with her. Had another lady, I felt like God said, take her to Legoland. I love Legoland. <laughs> <laughs> and we happened to go during the week, you know, so the kids were in school, and so we, there was hardly anybody there. And we're riding that one ride that, that goes around and shows the three little pigs, and I mean, it's just a little quiet. Anybody know the name of that? I don't know what the name of this ride was, but it's just real soothing, you know, and you go, and anyway, so we're on that, and um, we go all the way around, and as we're going around, she's just spilling her heart, and I'm thinking, okay, God, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is fun, I'm, I'm enjoying this, so we're, we go around, 
And we come to the front, and, and I'm thinking, we're not done. And so I asked the people that are, you know, the workers there, I said, can we go again? They said, sure, there's nobody in line. Thanks, God. So we go around again. I think we went around five times. <laughs> <laughs> nobody was in line. Or if they were, they, you know, they would take the other ones, and the, the worker just let us do it. And, I thought, and she just spilled her heart. Out. And I thought, this is the kind of ministry I like to do. <laughs> this is fun. Another thing, I, I'm making quilts. Nathan has, we've got a room in our house that we turned into a quilt room. And so I'm making quilts. I have ladies who come over there, and I tell you what, talk about good ministry. That's where it's happening. I'm not sitting in a room, you know, face to face and doing that. We're working on something together. We're doing something, and it's just natural. And it happens in we pray together. You know, one, one time we all had a really rough week. I said, guys, before we get started, we just need to pray. I don't know about y'all, but I feel like I need to pray. And we just gather, put hands together, and just started praying. And it was, you know, it was just so heart touching each other's hearts. You know, it just gives you a more vulnerability with each other so that you tell, the next time you tell a little bit more, I think they're saying. A little bit more, a little bit more. You can take me to Legoland anytime. I'm going to sign up for the Legoland ministry. I think Pastor Andre was going to have share something real quick. Yeah, Hudson's, it's, 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 you, know, you just feel, you feel welcome. It's relaxed. It's beautiful. But their hospitality all over the place, you know. Yeah. 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 I wanted to um, just go backwards a little bit when we were discussing the book. And... Um, <coughs> You know, our goal tonight is to encourage a lifestyle of the ministry of reconciliation, and that's what we're hearing tonight. I believe in impartation, and that's why we invited them in here tonight. And I think your book does that. There's an impartation through the hearing of the testimony, or the reading of the testimony, hearing of the testimony. And um, I just want to pause there for a second because it is a, it is a tool that we use a lot here at this ministry. You might be wondering, like. Why is it this book? There's thousands of books about freedom and healing. Why this one? And, you know, they attend our alcohol campus, and there's a testimony that's attached. And um, if you guys have read it, you know that it's very useful. When we're doing healing and freedom ministry, um, a lot of times it, we'll, we'll use it to see if people want their own freedom more than we want it for them. It's like, read this book, right? And uh, often... People don't need ministry after reading it because they've, they're they reading the truths about it and they're um, applying it. So we have that book as a part of our standard resources um, for this ministry. And that, that's just a little bit of backstory. Also as a part of our standard resources in Kingdom Life Ministry is Oswald Chambers' um, um, My Most For His Highest. And I just want to share a quick backstory on, on that for what that means for our family. Because I never had heard of that book. And we were sitting in our home one day. This is probably, what, seven or eight years ago? And my wife likes, I'm going I'm to share your business a little bit. You might have to pray for her afterwards now. <coughs> she likes to sit and she just likes to listen. And so I'm doing something less holy. I'm sitting next to her probably like watching Sports Center or something. And she's sitting there and she, she goes, hmm. And I was like, what? She goes, the Lord just said to me, my utmost were his highest. She's like, you know what that means? And I was like, no, I don't know what that means. And so I, I pulled my phone out, and I'm like, oh, it's a, it's a devotional. And she goes, oh, okay. Well, the Lord just said, my must for his highest. And that's it, end of conversation. Go to church in El Cajon, and um, I look up on a bookshelf, and I see my most for his highest sitting there. And I was like, oh, I was like, that's, that's the word my wife got. So I pull the, it looks old. The outside of the cover looks really old and it's like, um, it just looks old. But when I, when I go to open it, I can tell it had never been opened before. So I was like, oh wow. I was like, I don't know why this is here, but you know, I just put it back and I went on about my business. I let probably, here's confession time. I let about a couple of weeks go by and, and it didn't move and I'm like, that's mine. <laughs> so I take it. And um, I would like to say that I started reading it, but I didn't. I think it just, it kind of went into like the file cabinet where the books are and it made its way to the back of the bookshelf and didn't think of it. My wife and I entered a very difficult season. I think it's right around the time right before we, we met you guys. Very difficult. And 
I don't remember if it was you that got the word or me, but we were in bed and we're just like struggling and, and the Lord's like, my utmost for his highest. And I was like, oh yeah. So I had to go digging through the house and I found it and we started reading it. And for those of you that, that read that devotional, I mean, again, why out of thousands of devotionals, why my utmost? And just trust me, those, those that don't know, there's a reason why, why we um, put that as a resource. Um, it's such a blessing. So if you left your my utmost for his highest at El Colón campus, we stole it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll return it. The, the second part of that lesson is when the Lord tells you to read something, you should read it. Mm. Not the next year, but that year. <laughs> uh, just another note, if you are struggling financially and you don't want to invest in it, you can go to utmost.org and they post it every single day for free. You can actually have it sent to your email. So utmost.org, they, um, the book is like 100 years old, and so if you buy the original version, it's a little bit difficult to read, but they've updated it twice, and so you can pick if you want to read the original version, if you want to read the kind of in-between, or if you want to read the modern version. So you literally have no excuse today, so the Lord is, is telling you, go read it. <laughs> sure. Can I tell a demon story? Yeah, tell the demon story. Full warning. <laughs> let me tell you. Warning. Let me tell you on one note. If you do on a heart level, you will eventually run into demons. Okay. Um, I told one church that you guys shoot really straight. You just eighteen inches too high. <laughs> you're, you're both ahead in the heart. When you're teaching, you're teaching here. You get down here and you get some demons here. Um, so here's what happened. This is my first demon manifested this way. I got a call. My wife is attending, uh, getting her degree from a local Christian college just many years ago. And um, she had a couple of years of junior, junior college the last two years. So we started having college students attend our church. Um, and so one of the you know, I was discipling him. Uh, he wanted to be a pastor. And so I was meeting with him regularly. And so he said, well, I have a friend of mine at school that's in trouble. And I said, what's happening? Well, he says he lives in the dorm and he keeps pulling out switchblades and chasing guys to the dorms and nobody's enjoying it anymore. Um, they were sending him to a Christian psychologist, but the psychologist jumped up a collar bridge. He took him on a bridge, so the psychologist is no longer operational. So... They came over to dinner, and we had dinner. They, so these two young college students, both single, uh, came, had dinner with us, and sat around our kitchen table, and had dinner with us, and my children were young. Then I had built a little office in my backyard, scrap wood again, at a, at a uh, construction site, they give me their scraps. And I have a background in construction, so I just built a 10 by 12 little shed in my backyard. And so we went down there in the evening, and so this young man was in the next Marine, petite girl, and uh, as I listened to his story, he had been involved in every kind of immorality you could imagine. Uh, I had read about articles in the newspaper of some things that he had been participating in that they were trying to close down in a sort of industry that wasn't what they wanted. And he had been there in those situations. And so anyway, I, as I was walking through forgiving his mother, at three years old, at his three-year-old birthday party, he chose to throw a temper tantrum, and this demon came in. So I've only seen a demon one time at an altar call, the pastor just said when he manifested an altar call, what is your name and what do you make him do? I just saw it like that one time. So that's just, so he flopped, he actually landed, and was sitting between me, across from me, and just a small area, he landed on his back and his hands were put like this, and eyes were back in the socket and squirming around like that. And so I didn't even recognize it as being a demon, but the other young man did. So we pinned him to the ground, and I just said, Look at me. And when he wanted to do that, he opened his eyes. And I said, What is your name and what do you make him do? He says, My name is Bill Pior. I'm just the door opener for the other guys. And I was able to cast out Bill Pior, Brother Pizzo. Bill Pior is mentioned in the Old Testament. They're talking about Keith, they lack in Balaam. They're worshiping Baal, New York. The Jewish people are worshiping Saturday night they're going to an uh, you know, orgy, and then Sunday they're going to church. 
So they were doing both. So this young man was a college student, but he was going, you know, doing sexual things in a big way, you know, on this side thing. And so that was the door opener. Then there was another one named Mathaba. And, and then, so this young man smaller than me, he put me up in one hand by my shirt like this, and the other guy on the other hand like this, and they had to stand on their tippy toes. And, and so I just said, stop it! And when I did that, he fell to the ground, and the demon went back to the side of him. I said, okay, we've got one out, and we know at least there's one more, and we know his name is Matha. I also said, and so what is my name is, my name is Matha, I'm the God of rational thought, and I keep law and order in his life, and I make him smarter than he really is, you can't cast me out. And then it, you know. So, I didn't know what to do. So I'm in the pastor's prayer group, the next couple of days later, I said, hey, we had this happen the other night, and Pastor George Runyon says, well, I did some of that in the 70s, I'll help you out. So four of us pastors got together, we cast out four demons out of him one at a time over the next month or so. And one was had dual sexual perversion, and one he had a fascination for dead bodies, and they go to mortuaries. And, you know, there were various behaviors that he was he had repented of each one of them, and he did then he cast it out. After the first day the first one manifested, I led a neighbor to Christ who was a witch. And she said, Well, I've invited demons into me, I know, I've got them, so I'm going to get out of I don't know. I just got one out last night, that's all I know. <laughs> so I got two in the same week, um, going on. So that was my thrown in the deep end. The point is to say, you see how love, inviting them in our home, having a meal, that you opened up and told us things. So I ended up getting a call from this Christian college from the dean of men that said, oh, I'm in trouble. They're going to chew me out. Because he going on to tell people I cast out 17 demons. Well, there were four, not 17. And uh, he said, well, thank you for helping him. He said, he's a change guy. He's on the dean's list. We didn't want to lose him. He said, the students come to our college so broken these days, and we don't know how to help them. So thank you. He's changed, and now he can continue on in school. So I'm just saying, it was through loving, listening to him, privacy, and then what spirit showed up in power. When we dealt on a heart level, we got down to something that the psychologist couldn't get into on this level. And so I'm just saying, that was how I began, really, it was one heart at a time. And it was a year later until somebody else called the psychologist saying, I'm getting ready in my office, and that male voice is talking out of her. And she's carving Christmas trees on her legs with razor blades. Can you help us? I don't know, I did it one year ago, and I'm working out all around town, and I'm the exorcist or something. We can call George Runyon. <laughs> Anyway, that's thousands of sin. It's everywhere. It needs everywhere, but it's, you've got to heal on a heart level. Mm -hmm. And you love them, and, you get, and they finally tell you this deep stuff you never told anybody, and you help them just repent and forgive some. Forgiving from the heart is one on one. If you can just help them forgive each person that they're angry at one at a time, you'll get them free. It's like one tumor, gone, one father, your father, you know, forgive mother, you your aunt, an uncle, no luster, or whoever it is, one at a time. It's like you're cutting out tumors. And usually one of those frequently a demon's death or something so that. Mm. Uh, we're going to move on to our next section. I want you to set up this clip. Um, now we're fully into the demon talk, so I think we're ready. You guys are primed. Um, pay attention. Uh, this Nathan's going to set up this clip for us. In the background, this, uh, um, this is many years ago, 15 or more years ago. Um, actually, it was two days after 08. So, yeah, the election I was in the church out of state, and I would do a seminar, and then if people wanted a session, they would come in and I'd do a two hour session. The pastor sitting in with me. So, some demons had come out, some got back in, some had faked us out. It was, you know, it was, you know. So, um, I'm flying home, I'm thinking, this is a great training tool. Of course, this audio. So I got some tempting friends, that's not tempting friends. And so what we did is we came up with this, this, these screens where you can hear them talk. So you're going to see it's a D, that's when the demon's talking out of his mouth. When it's in, it's me talking. And then with man, when he's, his real voice is talking, you're going to see an M for man. You'll hear them, you can read it. Because sometimes the post is not clear, so I had to go back and say, clarify what it was. 
This is going to be entitled War in Heaven. And it's going to start off by saying, don't trust God. He might be like your mom and change his mind at the last minute and send you to hell. So don't trust God. Trust us. We're your friends. That's what they're saying. Okay? But don't trust God. He might be like your mom. It's like him. So that's what it puts the demons are always in A demon is there because somehow you want it. Somehow you like it. Somehow it's helping you. It's making you strong. I make you sexy. I make you smart. I make you uh, violent. I make you whatever. So somehow it's offering a child, usually almost always the demons come in to a trusting child. A trusting child. <coughs> Only the usually in the occult do they come in as an adult, a cult to cult invitation. But usually they do that because they believe God doesn't love himself with the dark side. <coughs> if people don't jump in the occult, it's fine. Usually because they're in the wrong power. <coughs> so um, so you're going to hear them say how they lost the war in heaven. Okay? It's pretty cool. In fact, we had to cut out the laughter. We were busting the gut for this stuff. Yeah, before we do that. I just want to think, okay. Um, did, I, did I hear a child in here? Is there a child in here? You might want to have dismiss them really quick. We're going to go into a time of uh, we're just learning from this, and it could be scary. Um, but this is a... This is the freedom ministry in the healing ministry. Right. So, but um, hopefully it'll be encouraging. But if we can uh, have somebody just walk us through that, that might be beneficial. Um, child is this? She's coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see you back there. I'm not going to see anything. Yeah, it's just audio. And um, I think there, there might even be some language. So I think adults are in the room now. Changes his mind. What if God changes his mind? God doesn't change. He's not a man that needs to change. Oh. God is consistent and faithful. But he keeps his vow. Because you rebelled. And you did not want to worship him. You want to understand. When did he kick, when did he kick you out? What happened? It was way before you gave him a long butt boy. Well, what, what happened? Tell us what happened. Our leader said, come on, let's get out of here. I was looking at him. He was so cool. And what happened? He was just... And it was a war in heaven, right? And Michael and the angels fought against you guys, right? Yeah, you know. Didn't you lose the battle in heaven? I hate Michael. That's right. I hate him. That's right. Why? Why do you hate him? He comes around and gets in our business. So you lost the war in heaven, didn't you? And you were cast out, right? Uh, huh? Well, was that really a war? What was it? We got our asses kicked. <laughs> Who kicked your asses? <laughs> the Holy One. Who else? Hmm. The Holy One and his army. Hmm. And then where were you sent when you were kicked out of heaven? Right where I am now, punk. So when you get, when you come out of tonight, where are you going to go? Oh! I'll tell you to go right now. Oh! Come out right now. 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 Come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. Pride. Come out. Repent. I repent of pride. I repent of pride. The pride of myself. Pride of myself. Image. I repent of prayer, so it doesn't matter what I am. I'm nothing. I'm just. I've been proud of my looks. I've been proud of my looks. What else, Lord? What else? Have I, I've been proud of my intellect. What else? Of my spiritual, of my spiritual gifts. Yeah, what else? Of my anointing. Yeah, what else? Education. What else? So. What else is you proud of, Lord? False pride. Huh? What is it? One of the demons is named Destruction. When did you come in? Age 12, he's saying, Appetite for Destruction, Guns and Roses. He's saying it, we came in. How to use the music industry. We own the industry. We write the songs. When they sing it, we come in. We've got many people who will still find out what you listen to. Let's look at the lyrics. We can verse by verse with the lyrics you just sang because you thought the music was cool, but you invite them in. See, look at what we're doing. We're pumping out garbage. Kids are seeing it all the time. And we don't realize they come in and now all of a sudden we start acting like the songs. See, so that's helping people repent. So you listen, you know, to you listen, you don't know where to go to start digging. The Lord start digging. And 
so people have to trust you before they come and tell you. And you said they're going to be in a bond in you sometime. Okay. I mean, why are you here? I'm, I'm having this kind of, I mean, I'll, sometimes they'll tell you a little bit, can you handle this much? You're not going to throw up or reject me? Okay, no, I'll tell you some more. You know, if you reject me, okay, there's some more stuff to put down here. They never told anybody, but until they do, they can't get free. That's what Jesus said to the disciples, whoever sent you forgive or forgiven. Whoever sent you retain or retain. So there's a need for the confessional for the right people. So we need to become those people that are safe, that love them. You know, it's about loving people. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Not cheap. Do you love me? Then I'm asking you, will you tend my lambs? Will you feed my sheep? And it's the love of the Father. Because he's loved us. It gives us his love for the body of Christ. And we're just wounded sheep everywhere. Mm. You know, rock church is so good at bringing in the wounded. We need more paramedics. Amen. And the paramedics got to be healthy first. But if you're sick and you get spread the infection with them, you say, we got to get us to help first. The more healthy you are, the more you have them to help. Right. And sometimes we have folks that are not healthy trying to minister to people and they get them sicker because, you know, I'm trying to say that you don't know, have the word, first of all, into my own heart. I'm trying to push it on you. So we need to get us further down the line. Awesome. We're going to take a quick break, five minutes, and then we're going to go into our Q&A time. So if you need to run to the restroom, please do so. Male restrooms are on the far right. Ladies' restrooms far left. Be back in five minutes, and we're going to do our Q&A. Thank you guys so much. Awesome, awesome. You guys blessed? Is this helpful? It's quiet out there. People are thinking. <laughs> I give uh, Wanda a little bit of time to get back up to you, but I wanted to. Um, I don't know. Let's see. So a lot of t- is this is this uh, is anybody hearing some new things for the first time, or is this pretty common yet? <laughs> So I think when we come together and we have these conversations, what I, we've, we've said this, this phrase many times, collective spiritual IQ, right? Where we're learning from other people's experience. And some of you guys have no experience in, in um, maybe on a freedom, and some people have a lot of experience and maybe don't do freedom and healing like Pastor uh, Nathan and Wanda. But the point is, is is we want to know what all of the options are, and we want to know how it can be done. And, and I think the one commonality for sure is the deep heart ministry is like that. You, you're not getting healed if you're not getting to the to the common denominator, right? And so my goal um, in doing this is not only to to glean off of just a lifetime of experience, but also we got to start doing the work. You know, when, when we're in our, my type of ministry and I, and I oversee this, I get all the feedback. Well, why do you say this? And who did that? And it's like, okay, I need you to just start doing it. Just start. <laughs> right? And so um, we're just very thankful for the stories that, that we're hearing. I did want to touch really quick and let my, my wife share. If you guys have something to um, really touch on how discipleship plays in, in all of this. And I'll let you kind of share your experience. Okay. Um, so I would say something that I desired for many years was close community. But I was not in a place where I was personally healed to allow people to come close. And so the Lord did a healing work in me first um, to uproot some of those deep wounds where I could actually let people into my home. I could be vulnerable. I could share my story because the Lord had healed those hurt places. Um, once that happened, um, I was able to actually start a discipleship group and have a group of five or six ladies that um, come to my home weekly and we meet and we 
we've talked about discipleship in here on uh, previous Kingdom conversations and the questions that we ask and what we talk about in our discipleship group, but I'd say what's really important is the freedom checklist or the blind spots checklist, whatever we want to call it. Um, we go through that regularly. So on a quarterly basis, we're checking in and doing that spiritual check-in as a group, and we'll address things as they come up right there. Um, and so that that has been really healing. And also I would say, too, that um, the Lord, of all the stuff that we've gone through in our life, the Lord, he doesn't waste anything. And I feel like every bit of my testimony, even the stuff where you're like, really that? The Lord will use it. And he'll use it to bring freedom to someone else. Um, and so it's just, it's been beautiful to watch the Lord do that, to use my story, to use those things that he killed in my life to help lead others to freedom. I think what um, we've seen, um, Pastor Vince is in one of my discipleship groups, and we're talking about deep heart ministry, we're talking about uh, spending time with people and listening, and, and <clears throat> We talk about effective discipleship. One of the things, uh, that's another message for another time, and we have some resource links on that, but one of the things I'm starting to realize is that when you when you get to the root with people, it usually removes any kind of uh, fence you can sit on. I'll just say it like that. And my experience in doing discipleship is, is people really, really get free and they accelerate or I see people completely walk away from God altogether. But we don't have a fence that you can sit on in between. And and I want to encourage that in this group, the reason I want to touch on discipleship as it pertains to healing and freedom ministry is I want us to start thinking about in these groups. You know, we have San Marcos Drove Down Together, uh, and we have El Cajon City Heights. We, um, we have uh, Chula Vista and Point Loma, and everybody's here together. <laughs> But I want you guys to start processing, like, what does it look like to start doing life together outside of your Monday or Thursday ministry? And we understand that you can't force chemistry, so I'm not saying be friends and, you know, or whatever. But I want us to start processing, you know, when we talk about living a lifestyle of reconciliation, um, we also want to have a lifestyle where we're actually in community together at some level. And so I just want to plant that seed um, because... I think it all ties together in this freedom walk. Awesome. Thank you for setting that up. Um, we're going to go into our, our Q&A time. It's been about 15 minutes here. And then at the end, we're going to have um, Pastor Nathan and Wanda pray over our time. My wife is going to be available. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. We're going to make sure that uh, it gets recorded for the camera. Um, and yeah, yeah, we'll get started. So this gentleman right here has a question. Hi, Pastor Nathan, this question's for you. Uh, you had talked about um, your, your sessions with the young gentleman lasting a couple of days and uh, several hours. Over time, as, you, as you've grown experience, have you had, how much has the, have those sessions shortened? And what's uh, average time look like now? I know they're all different. But... Well, some things that I do that speeds it up. First of all, unless you've read Freedom Through Forgiveness and Soul Surgeon, I won't meet with you. Otherwise, I've got to teach it to you for two hours. Now, I charge $200 per hour. Okay, so you're wasting your time and my time and my energy and your money. So I want to know that you've read those first. Because <clears throat> a lot of it you're going to find, wow, that's, that's look right there. That's the deal, whatever, so I'm saying to you. And then... Um, then I have a. Then once they've done that, I have a 20-page questionnaire. It's asks all detailed questions about your past occult, occult stuff and sexual things. It asks a lot of questions that I'm not okay, pretty much sure we got some areas to look at. So I've done that screening. <clears throat> um, when people came to me for a week, they flew in long distance, so I had one week to get all their to do all of it. If they live locally, what I would do is I'd have them come. We'd spend a two, I plan, I block off three hours. I listen to two, three hours. Sometimes we get it all done in two, three hours because their heart's prepared. A lot of times we did. Or sometimes, okay, you got one step to take. Now you go home and do this step, and you come back to me after you've done that one step. Jesus did this. He spit their eyes, so you go wash them out. 
You pick up your bed and walk. You give half your wealth back to the poor that you stole that money. So we got to realize his model is he gave them something to do that was their obedience step. If they didn't do it, he didn't do anything more with them. <clears throat> so I'm listening for one step of obedience. Um, <clears throat> I had a lady come one time, a pastor's wife. Her story's in my book, drug addicted. And, and so I listened all week long. The demons were talking out of her most of the week. And we did it as a marriage intensive. Came down the last day, the last hour, going, She's, this is stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. I said, okay. One thing you knew, we found one thing for you need to leave your father, leave and cleave to your husband. She'd never renounced a soul tie with her daddy, who was a retired pastor. So I said, okay, it, you've got to do that. And I walked out of there leaving her in the office going, I don't know what she's going to do tonight. She's going to fly home. And the church had said, unless you come back free or divorce your wife, then the pastor, they're going to fire the pastor. Because she was buying drugs off the people. So in the church. So the church said, you've got to get free. And they'd already, she'd already been through drug treatment programs three or four times, spent a lot of money, but it was demonization. <clears throat> so she did it. She came down from my office. She goes, she goes, I did it. I called my dad. He said, I knew an hour ago you are going to do that. And she did it, and the demons left her. She went left drug-free and stayed drug-free. So that one step of obedience. I'm listening for one, to take one step forward. It's amazing what will break off of someone. So sometimes I'm listening going, there's just, like that one, if this, just forgive one person from the heart is success. In fact, if you did nothing but help them just learn to forgive one person from the heart, huge change, okay? Now, who's the next person? Oh, the next person is easy. I know how to do that now. But teaching a person how to forgive, and that one wrestling hold of forgiving from the heart is 99% is 90 of what I had to do all the time. People intellectually have forgiven because they know they're supposed to, but their heart's going, mm -mm -mm, I'm not letting go of this. And so that is the biggest thing. The number one thing is help them be honestly angry. Get the anger out in your office and then forgive someone. And when they do, all that rage comes out and then forgive them. I don't want to forgive them because that's why you're stuck. But you get the rage out, the anger out. If the person swears, that's okay. That's, you're already thinking it. Just say it. It won't shock me or God. And then forgive. And then it went away. The demon left. Huh. I feel better. Now I can do my dad. Now I can do my uncle. Now I can do my ex-wife or whatever. So it, so it doesn't have to take three days, but it just is stubborn will is what wears me out. You're walking through the stubborn will for three days. So now I don't. Well, I will not work with them unless I'm convinced they've already laid down their stubborn will. Otherwise, I ain't gonna fight through three. I don't have the energy at 73 to fight with your stubborn will for three days. Go fight with the devil. I don't fight with your wife, but don't fight with me. I don't have the energy for that. So just so more discernment going, are they ready yet? It's like it's trying to hard it's kind of hard to deliver a baby that's seven months. Nine months, you're pretty good. Seven months, you know, you're just uncomfortable. So many times they wanna do we have a baby yet? I want to share share something. Um thank thank you for sharing that. Um last kingdom conversations we talked about the role of the prophetic as it pertains to healing and freedom. And you even shared, you know, about getting in the dream about the guy and he was having an affair and all that stuff. And I know that there's been some uh, kind of recent revelation on that. You want to share with that a little bit? I think that might help a little bit with what you're saying too when we're talking about time. Yeah, if we, my gifting is more, I can sense the pain that's over here and I ask probing questions to get there. So if we have somebody that's prophetic and they're going to go, okay, I'm, I see you're three years old, you're sitting at your own tree and you're holding a peach. Okay, there, what's happened? We could get to that faster but then to listen to three days to finally tell me that. So if we have prophetic lined up, I just haven't had very many prophetic people to find them that are healthy or they're even available. So linking up, but if we have a teacher gift, PT, pastor, shepherd, teacher gift, along with prophetic, be a great team to inform those teams together and then learn how your gift operates and segue together. Yeah, I wanted that to be highlighted. And I also wanted to honor honor you because what I'm hearing in your story is you're learning this stuff on the fly with nobody to help. We're sitting in a room with coaches and captains and books that we can read and all this stuff. He didn't come up with that. And we get to glean off of the years and decades of his trial and error and success and testimony. But I, I, I kind of want to just pick just pick apart just a little bit what you're saying because when we talk about the time thing it's like yeah i mean sometimes it's days weeks years some t but in a ministry setting we got however long we have and guess who knows that god god knows that and so 
I, I wanted just to honor your approach in your years while, while, while letting you share about like, yeah, I mean, it's great if you have a prophetic person and experience or husband, wife couples and all these different combinations. And um, does that help? Does, it, does that answer? Okay, cool. Hmm. Is this on? <laughs> uh, can you give everybody in here your opinion on uh, the difference between a godly soul tie and an ungodly soul tie? Between a godly and an ungodly soul tie. Well, a godly soul tie I have with my wife. That's one husband and wife, and we're intimate physically and emotionally and mentally and all that, so that's a godly soul tie. Um, uh, an ungodly soul tie is some one I had sex with that I'm not married to, or even not just intercourse, I did a makeout session, and so we bonded, and, and we, so that's, obviously it's it's uh, at least fornication, but a lot of people today will tell me, well, we didn't have actual intercourse, but we did, you know, everything else but that, and so we're still virgins. No, not really, you've bonded with them. And, and, uh, and so many times, one of the things we have to do to get someone free is to go back and name the 34 women you slept with. The bar on 3rd Street, I don't even remember her name, but it was one ideal, and then they'll, it's interesting, they will remember 34. And we had to go through, and so as we're going through announcing soul ties, all of a sudden the demon manifests on woman number five. Okay, let's find out why it's, that's there. Let's go back and whatever. And so um, we have some young people here today that we had that happen and brought a friend, soul time number five, manifest. So we went and said, you're getting baptized, bring your swimsuit. And demons and cats don't like baptistries. <laughs> <laughs> and they came out of the hot tub, they came out of the cold hot tub growling. And then we got a bunch more out, but there was still one hanging out that we didn't know. And that was abandonment. And so a month later, abandonment gets exposed. And abandonment says when father and mother divorced, dad got killed in a car wreck, and then brother, then the abandonment said to a teenager, everyone will abandon you eventually, including your wife, including God. So have another old woman lined up for when your wife abandons you, which got him into more stuff. And so as we prayed, then abandonment got exposed we actually had to turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh in prayer. In long distance, God answered that prayer. And of course, what am I doing? And came back, and we got the last one out was abandonment. And they went on to do well. But that one was hiding out, even though about 12 or 13 came out in the baptistry. So I've had seven people manifest in a hot tub that, was, that had been baptized once or twice before that once they really repented and then they got baptized, then one time 12 came out of one person as we baptized them. So I've learned that. I've never, you know, so we we're having baptisms for people. Okay, think about this, guys. This is, this is, this is kind of, okay, as you listen to the altar call prayer, we don't say the word repentance. We don't give people time to think about repenting. I'm sorry for my sins, but I'm going to rob a bank again. <laughs> but I'm sorry. You know, I got caught, <laughs> but I'm sorry. But I'm planning to do it again if I get a chance. See, admitting your sin is not the same as repenting for sinning. Confessing is not the same as admitting. I admit that I robbed the bank. It was pretty good. I enjoyed that money. So deep, so taking the time to let someone deeply repent and go away and repent and think about it before you pray this lordship prayer. God, I give you everything, all of me, and my future plans. You know, I, play, I said, people, people come to you, I'm stuck, I can't grow. Okay, let me have you take a walk down the road, get a country road we live on. And as you're walking down there, give your life 100% to God. Say, God, everything I am and everything I have, all my future is yours. Anything you want, my answer is yes. And I speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Tell me one thing to do. If I've done it before, if you've said it before, say it again. Say it louder, because, but I'm going to do it because I want to get free. And when you pray that prayer and you stick around and listen, which means be still and know that I'm God, not turn off the crank up the movies, box the cell phone, da, 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 da. be still and be and know that I'm God is the main thing that people come to me, spend time alone with God and ask him this question and come back to me. 
and they come back going, he told me one thing to do. I don't like for me. I didn't want to go ask that guy to forgive me for hating him. I did not want to do that, but I wanted freedom. And when I did that, my whole world changed that one day. So helping people get free, discipling their heart is helping them hear God and obey, hear and heed what he says. If they'll do that one thing, everything will break loose because they've finally given their will over to God. And so when they go under the water, it means I'm giving my whole body, mind, and spirit to you. My future choices are all your choices. Now speak, Lord, for your servant listens. And we'd really pray those kind of prayers. But God, help me out. I'm a jam. Please help me out. I need some more money. But we don't say, God, I give you. I didn't want to be a pastor, guys. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to be a counselor and hear pain. All I hear is pain, pain, sorrow, sorrow, sin, sin. It's heartbreaking. That's the reason they come, not because they're healthy, because they're sick. And it's hard, it's hard to hear that. And you love people, you do it. It's like, oh, week long here. I've never heard so much in my life. And the next person who shows up tells you more than you ever heard before. Like, oh, my goodness. So, But people need that. And this is discipleship. This is discipling the heart, one heart at a time. If it, so I block off two to three hours to really listen, plan on two, but I've got three, so you're not rushed, you know. We sit down there, I'm going to listen carefully. Okay, let's take some notes. Okay, we've got to go back. There's that one thing. We've got to go back to that. Holy Spirit, show us one thing to do. And so you're listening to the Holy Spirit, and you're listening to what they're saying, and taking the word and applying the, 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 the Lord's surgery. Let me give you an example. Just came to mind. We were teaching out of country at a foreign in foreign country. <clears throat> we were a group of pastors, and we were at this about as many people as you have here. <clears throat> they were primarily non-charismatic denominational types, okay, and we knew that. So we were always careful to not stir up the dust too much, to, okay. So you could say things that blow things up, and you could say things to kind of you know. So my friend was teaching on the Father Heart of God. He had a real revelation in the fatherhood of God. So he was teaching, and I was sitting on the back row in the very back. I wasn't teaching that night. As he went to the close of the teaching, a woman in the front row on this side fell out of her chair and went into convulsions. She was a missionary wife. There's a doctor and his wife over here that was their, actually their medical doctor in this country. So the doctor went over to take care of her, the doctor's wife was a psychologist, and the doctor and his wife had been to my seminary, the pre seminar the previous year. They know what I do. His wife had sit in on my ministry sessions and seen my model. So <clears throat> everybody else is kind of filtering out. She's over there laying on the floor, and they had a paper bag over her mouth. thinks she's hyperventilating. So I walked over there just to kind of see, and I saw the same manifestations as 30 years earlier, the same demon hands contorted, eyes pulled back in the socket, and I'm going, oh, okay, this is for me. So I went over there to the, the psychologist, and I said, tell your husband this might be a spiritual issue, not a medical issue. She goes, oh, I get it. So she went over to her husband and said, Ken, Nathan says this might be a, a spiritual issue. So I said, can I pray for her? So I went over and just quietly whispered in her ear, in Jesus' name I bind you, I'll deal with you tomorrow. She goes, oh. What's going on? She set up and dusted herself off. She was embarrassed that she was laying on the floor. And I said, let's get together tomorrow. So we got together the next day. I think I list for four or five hours. This is the third time this had happened. Once on her honeymoon, once on her 15-year anniversary, and now the third time. They thought she had a brain tumor. They were going to send her home off the mission field. As I listened to her story, here's what I remember of her story. She was 17. Her mom and dad took her for dinner. Dad says, I'm divorcing your mom. She and mom moved out. Girlfriend moved in. A month later, her mom, her mom hung herself. She had to go live with her dad and new stepmom. I said, how did you forgive that at 17? Oh, I did. How did you forgive that at 17? It helped to get the anger out toward her father. See, my, my friend's teaching on the father heart of God triggered that. I helped her forgive her father, and it went away. No more brain tumor. Now, my wife mentioned something. See, it's not about demons. Don't get excited about demons. Yeah, they're there, 
they're going to be around. But you know, I cast out 15 demons. It's not, you don't want them lined up. You don't want people lined up at your door. You don't want that to be your badge you're wearing. You'll attract every bug in the world to go. Bugs are attracted to light, okay? So, <laughs> bright lights. <laughs> So I guarantee you don't, there, but if you help, listen, if you love someone and you deal on a heart level, sooner or later, you're going to run into one. You're going to lift up a rock and there's one, you know, it jumped out. They're there. They're everywhere. They're all around. And we just, they, we've been clueless to their existence. They've been in your family. Okay. And so as you just love, as God, listen, God will bring someone to you on the level of experience that you have. He'll bring someone that he knows you could help. In fact, you say, God, if you have someone who may help, just bring them to me. And he'll bring them to you. You don't, have to, you don't have to fish for them. They'll come to you. God will bring them to you. Then take the time, be the right environment, have a team member. They've got a committee, a team. You should have a team. It's tag team. So have a friend. Always try to minister with a friend, like two, two on one. Because that way you can segue. One of you be praying while one's listening. One's taking notes when you've got, you got your Bible out. So you can segue. Because it's really tough you get to carry it by yourself. And, and, and I always like to have a, somebody else that we're both praying, we're both listening. Sometimes this person gets a word of knowledge that I didn't get, that pulls it, that I didn't get the word of knowledge, but they had it, but I got the teacher gift. And so you'll find someone that you, that you work really well with, be a good team. You know, again, guys with gals, guys with guys, okay, or a couple together so that you're a married couple. Was, I, when I would have ministry sessions, I'd always have a woman sit in that's a mature Christian woman, but I'd always change my team members so it wasn't me and the woman bonding that we were, you know, because Wanda doesn't like to sit in those, so I'd, but I wouldn't be the same woman all the time. So I want to be really, really careful against, you know, uh, ministry Bonds, uh, connections like that. I don't want that. I don't that to happen. So the privacy, but that, but well, that way, if something sexual is said, there's a witness that it, that I didn't do anything. That way, we'll know there's no secrets to things because I'm always having to hear things that are sexual things, and you have to help and teach with those things that are that that someone's learned backwards and they've done some kind of perversion or something, or they've got. A, so they need help with that. But that's where, and that's where, if a lady needs a hug. Then I got a lady to sit beside her and give her that mother hug because I don't touch the ladies. I don't touch them, you know. So that, so you want to be wise as serpents, okay? So we don't want to be afraid of helping people, but do it in an appropriate way so that the enemy can't get in there and 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 do something, you know, impure. So be wise about it. Be accountable. If you're, I would suggest that if you're meeting someone, you let your your spiritual leader know, I'm working with so-and-so, she and I are going to meet together, here's my team member, and would you be praying for us as we go into the situation? Uh, if you use a questionnaire, let them see the question, you give permission for your leaders to know, so it's not some, because sometimes you'll have a, <clears throat> a person will set you up by telling you some, like I'm having an affair with my whatever, and you, you unless you have permission to share that with your leader, They'll sometimes drop a bomb on you. It happened once to me. And fortunately, her friend was sitting in when she told she was having an affair with somebody. Since her friend sat in, uh, and I had to take her out of a position of leadership when she confessed that. But since I had a witness to what she said, then I was covered. Otherwise, she would have denied it ever happened. And I can't go uncover this woman who's practicing immorality. Um, and so I was glad I had her own friend sitting in to hear it, not just me. It wasn't just my opinion. So both of us together heard it so we could deal with it together. So, again, you you're, you're, you're were talking warfare, and the enemy, you know, doesn't like the ground we're taking. So we want to be wise as serpents, you know, but harmless as doves. I think, I think the I th we really we really want to have time for you guys to pray for the ministry. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we'll answer yours afterwards. <laughs> I just wanted to um, ask about the importance of when a demon manifests and hearing the Holy Spirit so that if a demon manifests while you're praying for someone how to handle that because I've been in situations where the Holy Spirit has told me to maybe pull the car over with a friend where I'm uh, discipling someone and that demon manifests and it's just me and I have to pull the car over and hear from the Holy Spirit because there was a danger because this demon began to manifest in him and, his and that type of thing. So just some, how do we navigate that when we're on our own and um, maybe having to cast out a demon that starts to 
strongly manifest? Is that Okay, so you're saying you're driving and the person's with you in the car and the demon starts manifesting? Okay, well, first of all, I say demons want to go back inside. So something's happened in the conversation to have exposed it. But demons want to stay inside that house and stay there. So Jesus name, I bind you. Shut up and go down inside. So it'll usually buy, it'll, it'll just kind of, it, want, it wants to go down and hide. So listen, you have authority over it, and you don't have to say it loud. They, they hear whispers. They hear really well. In Jesus' name, I bind you. In fact, you can even do this. I bind you in Jesus' name. Be quiet. And, they'll, they'll, and when, if you, it's like a cop. He knows his authority. Pull over, sir. Then you go, I'm going to pull over. Now, please, if you don't mind, please pull over. No, you have authority. So when you speak in Jesus' name, I bind you. Shut up and go down inside. It'll go down inside. Now let's set up, now let's set up a ministry session for you. Um, and then you set it up with your team, prayer going in there, you set up the situation, and then the person's going to come knowing that they're going to have an encounter, then they want to help, and that way you get your team set up, you get the room set up, you get the time, the whole deal, and then, and then in the meantime, start praying, God, would you give me discernment? What do I look? What am I looking for? Do I know anything about the situation that lets me know why it's there? So that's where... Sometimes it would take me a couple weeks to pray, going, give me discernment. Something they said triggered, oh, I remember what it was. They said this, there, that's what it is. And so that I was there praying and asking God to show me what's, see, because demons operate on legality. They have to have a legal right to be there. So somewhere there's unforgiveness, occult background, I'm an affair, soul tie. There's some reason that it's there. And if, you've, if you know their story, sometimes you go, oh, that's probably because of this. I'll look in that department. That's where the questionnaire, the thorough questionnaire that I think you guys use, would go. And if they won't fill that questionnaire out and sign off on it, don't mess with them. Awesome. Well, we're going to have you guys pray as we wrap up our time together. So I'm going to leave the mic on and see you on share. Thank you guys so much for being here. And um, again, guys have time to chat afterwards, but there's going to be some resources that they brought from right around the corner in the back. So let's pray. Okay, Father, we thank you, first of all, that you said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And you said, Lord, to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he send forth laborers into his harvest. I thank you that you've given us authority over the demonic that we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of the Lords, and we have royal authority. It's not our strength, but we're under when we're under your authority and we're going out in your name to do your will, then we have your power to come. And we and the enemy is already a defeated foe. They know that. And now we're learning the authority that we have. And Lord, we go forth in humility and God dependency. This is not our identity as the demon caster routers. That's not who we are. We are sons. And when you told the disciples, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. That's our lasting identity is we're sons and daughters of the king of kings that you adopted us, you love us, you're excited about this journey, and you're really pleased. So, Lord, I just pronounce your blessing on everyone here. Lord, I thank you that we are circled with your angels. As each one goes home tonight, Lord, circle every one with ten angels. Each one, Lord, you get plenty of them. Angels go before us, behind us. Lord, thank you that surely goodness and mercy will follow us. Lord, you're our rear guard. You go before us, and when we're, when we're going where you want us to go, not our own will, but you've called us in the heart ministry that you're going to go before us and prepare hearts. And Lord, I pray that we'll have the discernment to know, yes, this person's ready. No, this person needs to do some more soaking. This person needs to, is a Zacchaeus. This person's not. That you'll give us to know who the right ones to invest in. Lord, I pray, Lord, where you teamed up the disciples two by two by two, <clears throat> that you team up some teams that feel called and gifted to work together, complementing with the different giftedness and going together as a team to set captives free. Lord, just like the children's game, Red Rover, Red Rover, we're praying for those that are caught by the enemy will come over and join our team and, and, and build a strong army of those who know and walk in wholeness to help catch more labor laborers and add them to our team from the other from the enemy's team so we want to thank you that you can use every hurtful thing that's happened in our past as our equipping for the future all the wounds that the enemy intended for evil you intended for good so we thank you in advance for the victories that are going to happen right around the corner 
And it's one heart at a time. Just one heart at a time. And Father, I pray that as these that are here in this room are going to go beyond the front lines, um, working to help get splinters out of parts of, of our brothers and sisters, Father, that even in their homes, they would be able to feel like they're linked up with their spouse and that we are on the same team and that we're not fighting against them, but they have the spouse being able to pray for them as they're going into battle. Father, I ask that that hearts uh, between spouses would go deep, that you would give even more love. I, God, I ask that you would add, that whoever is interested would ask you, Father, give me love for my spouse. Maybe it's not there. Maybe it's weighing a bit. Maybe I, I've had to pray that with my kids. God, I need you to give me love for my kids because right now I'm going to kill them. So, Father, I ask that you would do that even here that in our homes, that it is so rock solid that whenever Satan comes and he does tempting, because he does do that, that they would be able to be praying for each other um, when those times come, so that we will not fall, but we'll be able to stand. I pray that in your name. Let me mention one more thing to you. Um, starting tomorrow, Vince is going to be helping us and some others. We're going to be putting together a YouTube channel that people can get this kind of counseling training for the wounded person and then for counselors. So probably four or five, six months from now, we'll have it up and running. We're just starting tomorrow to videotape and sit down. And uh, Brady Duke over here and Andrew are two guys on our team. And so uh, we're going to be doing some taping tomorrow. Vince is helping us. So we're just starting to put this together with more people than those who sit in my office can be there because there's not enough of us to go around. And that way people can learn at midnight in their house and learn, 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 and get stuff already processed. Then when they need a ministry session, then they could finally come down. We could do a Zoom where we could have persons Zoom in and train, train someone while we're doing it. And then if they need a one-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball, then we can filter it down to now you're ready. Now if we need eyeball to eyeball. And so we're going to set a plan that we can help more people, equip and train more people, as well as save our energy for that person that's really, really ready and say, teach you to save your energy to make sure they're really ready first before you go in there and block off three hours of time and get your babysitter and all the work that goes along with that one-on-one encounter. So although yours together, Together, um, and this, the tech, tech skills is coming together for such a time as this. So pray for us on that, if you would, okay? So next steps, we have a slide real quick that we're going to put up. Um, Shadow and Healing and Free Ministry. So again, I know we have people from different teams that are here, but if you haven't gotten a chance to, please talk to a Healing and Life coach about shadowing in one of those areas. This QR code will take you to uh, a Google Doc that has a list of resources, including the books that have been mentioned tonight, um, YouTube videos, um, a list of great things. The blind, spot, blind Spots checklist that we use in this ministry is also on there. And then there's a video on that link about effective discipleship that really want to encourage you to watch. And we want to invite you to join us for next month's Kingdom Conversation. It will be August 19th in this room at 6.30. We will be discussing how to do in different baptisms. Awesome. Well, we're already praying, so God bless you guys. Thanks so much for being here tonight.